Hello there, I'm Dan, and welcome to another video on RetroTech. This time, we're going to be looking at the eMac, a budget all-in-one Macintosh desktop computer produced specifically for the educational market by Apple in 2002. Apple unveiled the eMac on the 29th of April 2002, a new desktop line specifically designed for education. With the familiar shape of the original iMac, it wouldn't be too far out of place in the corner of your bedroom. However, this Mac, with a 17-inch 1280 by 960 flat screen CRT display, driven by the NVIDIA GeForce 2 MX technology with up to 1GB of RAM and a 700MHz G4 processor, the same one that was in the much more powerful and much more expensive Power Mac G4, was originally intended to only be sold within the educational system. At the time, Macworld reported that Apple officials stated the eMac was created to specifically address the needs of academic institutions that may not be able to afford a lot of 1399 flat panel iMacs, and that schools may fear that the computer's fragile looking screen and neck won't stand up to the heavy punishment school kids can dish out. And fragile it is not. Standing in at almost 23 kilograms, or 50 pounds, it weighed almost as much as Apple's target audience. Originally coming in two configurations, a 32-speed CD-ROM model for $9.99 and a CD-rewritable DVD-ROM or combo drive model for $11.99. The eMac also had a standard assortment of Mac ports on the right-hand side, such as two Firewire and three USB ports, a video out, a 3.5mm audio jack, an analog audio input, a 100 megabit Ethernet port and a 56K modem port, which were all easily accessible for the user. This was the peak of I.O. On the front, the eMac boasts two whopping 18-watt speakers that deliver crisp audio that can still rival a lot of desktop speakers today. In the center, the door opens up to reveal the specs of the system and, above that, the CD or DVD drive depending on the model that was purchased at the time. The eMac is standing on the optional £49 or $49 eMac tilt and swivel stand that not only adds a little bit of flair and style to the computer, but also raises it by 3 inches or 7.62 centimeters. The stand also enables the eMac to tilt with ease with its minus 5 to 15 degree arc of movement and also allowing the eMac to swivel 360 degrees on its axis. Originally coming with the Apple Pro keyboard and Apple Pro mouse in 2002, they have long since been lost. So, the ones we have here today are the Apple keyboard from 2003 and the Apple Mighty Mouse from 2005. Altogether, it is a tightly packed and dense computer that takes up roughly the same space as a normal CRT monitor, which is handy considering classrooms have a finite amount of space. When I picked up this eMag, it was already on Mac OS X Tiger 10.4.11. However, it had a lot of personal information on it, so I wanted to start afresh. I typically like to do this anyway, as I tend to prefer stock systems. After downloading a couple of ISOs from archive.org and burning them to DVD, the eMac wouldn't read the discs. After some troubleshooting, I realized that this eMac had the CD drive in, so it obviously wasn't going to read the DVD discs. Luckily, I had a spare Power Mac G5 lying around that just happened to have a spare DVD drive installed. So, I went about swapping the CD drive for the DVD drive. It took a little while, but that was the easy part. I switched the machine on whilst holding down the option button on the keyboard so I could get to the boot selection menu. I put in the first disc and pressed the refresh button. Install Mac OS X popped up on the screen. Fantastic. I go through all the options to install Mac OS X Tiger 10.4 only for it to fail at 98%. Okay, no problem, I'll try it again, and again, and again. So, 10 ISOs later, I still had no luck. I decided to see whether cloning a hard drive would enable the eMac to boot up. I have a fully working and stock Power Mac G4 that is running 10.4.11, so I thought I'd give it a go. I took the eMac apart again and removed the hard drive, downloaded a copy of Carbon Copy Cloner, plugged it into the Power Mac G4 and went to work. After two hours, the copy had completed. I installed the hard drive back into the eMac and it worked. Well, it worked until we got to the login screen and it would crash. 
I tried this a few times, but it just wouldn't work. Back to square one. So as you can probably imagine, this was getting incredibly frustrating. What could it be? The hard drive? The DVD drive? The PRAM battery that is completely dead? Well, it wasn't any of them. It was the ISOs themselves. Because my ISP likes to throttle torrent downloads, I decided to use an online downloader, which would then generate a link for me to download at my max speeds. Every ISO I downloaded was placed into a RAW file and, when extracted, the RAW file would fail the CRC check. I dismissed that because when I mounted the ISOs using some software, they were readable. Anyways, to cut a long story short, I had an epiphany whilst I was at work and decided that when I got home, I would download the ISOs via torrent, so it wouldn't be in the RAW file. So, that's exactly what I did. I burned the DVD, put it into the eMac, selected the boot installation disk, went through all the options and it installed. Two whole days of troubleshooting for it to be my mistake. The machine is totally fine. So here we have it, a fresh install of Mac OS X Tiger 10.4, but the latest supported OS for this machine is Tiger 10.4.11. Therefore, we just have to update it. Are we going to burn another DVD or transfer the file over USB for that? No, we're going to do it over the air. Yes, that's right. I can't believe that this computer is almost 20 years old and we are able to plug it into an Ethernet cable, connect it to the internet, download and subsequently install the latest update. It just blows my mind. Before we continue looking at the eMac, it needs a thorough clean after years of use. There are a few stickers on the side, some paint marks on the back and plenty of dust scattered on and inside the eMac. I didn't clean or remove any dust when I opened the eMac to begin with because I wanted to save it for this video. The keyboard has also seen better days and has some grimy looking goop in between the plastic housing and the keyboard backplate. I'm going to clean this up by taking the keyboard apart, throwing the keys and housing into some soapy water and giving them a nice little scrub before rinsing them and leaving them to dry.
So, here we have it. A refurbished and stock EMAC from 2002 running a fresh install of Mac OS X Tiger 10.4.11. In the end, I decided to leave the stickers on the side of the EMAC, as they are a reminder of the days that it had spent within the educational system. The keyboard has also been given a new lease of life and looks great alongside the EMAC. Whilst cleaning the keyboard, I realized that there would be enough room for a Raspberry Pi to be mounted within the housing. So, I was thinking that I would create my own little cyber deck out of an Apple Pro keyboard and a spare Raspberry Pi I have lying around. If you're interested in something like that, stay tuned for future videos by subscribing to my channel. Steve Jobs was quoted saying, Consumers have pounded the table demanding to buy the eMac, and we agree. So, on the 4th of June 2002, mere days after Apple announced that the eMac was only going to be sold in the educational market, they announced that the eMac would be sold to consumers. Over the following three years, subsequent revisions to the eMac line added ATI graphics and a 1GHz G4 processor in 2003, USB 2.0 capabilities in 2004, and a Speedia 1.42 GHz G4 processor and RAM upgrades released in May 2005. However, that final model was short-lived, considering Apple's discontinuation of the entire product line by October 2005, which made way for the introduction of Intel products that would last for the next 15 years. If you like this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. If you'd like to watch more content like this, and about other retro tech, tech reviews, repairs, and DIY projects, be sure to check out my channel and subscribe. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram, at TheRetroTech, and, as always, thanks for watching.